Good evening, and welcome once again to our study on Revelations. Tonight, <clears throat> we will be looking into the sixth seal. We hope to get through uh, the first three verses of chapter seven. <clears throat> so uh, get your Bible out. We are going to refer to a lot of verses tonight. So I would encourage you to jot them down, ask for the notes. They are all in there. And so uh, just be ready. There's a lot of exciting things here that we're going to learn as, as we see on the throne room of heaven, the sixth seal is open. Remember, uh, we had the, uh, the, the first five seals. The first seal was the white horse. The second seal, uh, we had the, the, the uh, red horse, the black horse and then the pale horse, which represented death. So the black horse represented famine, the red war, and bloodshed, and then the uh, pale horse represented the grave. So anyway, a lot of things happening. And then we had uh, the fifth seal, which was those who had been martyred uh, were crying out for justice uh, from under the altar, which is where sacrifices were made. Uh, we talked about that last week. We'll go back into that. So something to remember during this time that all these events are occurring people are going to be just carrying on like it's like it's, uh ever bit like it's business as usual for most people as we look into matthew 24 remember we ask you to read that because it's where jesus talks about this and he in in 24 verse 37 and through 39 it says as it was in the days of noah so it will be at the coming of the son of man for in the uh, days before the flood, people were uh, eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Okay. Now, I want to read this uh, in chapter 7, or excuse me, uh, chapter 6, verse 12. And we're going to read through the end of chapter 6. It says, I watch, we're at verse 12. It says, I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red, and the stars in the sky fell to earth. At late, as late figs dropped from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind, the sky receded like a scroll rolling up and every mountain and island was removed from its place then the kings of the earth the princes the generals the rich the mighty and every slave and every free man hid in caves and among the rocks in the, of the mountains they called to the mountains and the rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? So we see this sixth seal open. Now, it would be so devastating and terrifying that it will be attributable only to God. Okay, first will be a great earthquake. There have been many earthquakes in recorded history and more during the first half of the tribulation in Matthew 24, 7. Yet even John, yet the event John saw in this seal is to be far more powerful and devastating than any previous earthquake. In fact, this one will shake more than just the earth, okay? The Greek word used here, uh, is translated as earthquake literally means a shaking so the earth will shake all right in matthew 8 24 it describes a great storm on the sea of galilee the same words was used shaking there will be a great shaking let's look at how the prophets describe the day of the lord now uh, i have a book uh, that i do a lot of studying from uh, and it is uh, life application bible commentary I have some extra copies of this if uh, some of you who are faithful listeners uh, want to, to read, but, but there are several references here. We're going to look at some of them, but there is uh, references in Isaiah 2, 10 through 22, Isaiah 34, 4, Jeremiah 4, 23 through 29, Ezekiel 32, 7 and 8, Hosea, Joel, 
Amos, Nahum, Zephaniah, Malachi, all of these prophets spoke about this day of the Lord. So this is not something that John saw that was brand new. This has been talked about uh, in the New Testament. It's been talked about in the Old Testament. So this is, uh, uh, this is very validated as far as the prophecy of Scripture is concerned, okay? Now, uh, a lot of word pictures are used as this is talked about, all right? We see di in, in the previous seals, we see different areas, but here we see not just a fourth of the earth, a third of the earth, or so many, we see the whole world is going to be affected, okay? These pictures were very common to the people that were listening to John. The earthquake in Scripture always signified God's presence, okay? If you look over into Exodus 19, <clears throat> verse 18, it said, Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. We see in Isaiah 2, 19 through 21, how people will flee to caves and the rocks and to holes in the ground from the fearful presence of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty when he rises to shake the earth. In that day, people will throw away to the moles and uh, to bats their idols of silver and idols of gold, which they made to worship. They uh, will flee to caverns in the rocks and to overhanging crags from the fearful presence of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty when he rises to shake the earth. So here we see Isaiah talking about this and we see John observing it when this seal is open. And I love it when I'm able to go back and look at things that are said in the Old Testament come to, come, come to reality in the New Testament. John is seeing reality here. And so that is, that, that is great. The color of the sun is black like goat hair. A robe made from a black goat was worn in times of mourning. The moon will be red due to the sun being darkened, okay? And the stars falling to the earth could signify a terrible meteor shower striking the earth. Now, if we go back to Joel chapter 2, verse 30 and 31, he says, I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So we see this day of the Lord coming and uh, been wrote about, been talked about coming to fruition. So the prophets seen this, talked about it as well. The panic stricken sinners will react irrationally. All right, foolishly attempting to hide themselves in the caves and among the rocks of, of the mountains. So we always hear people say, well, you know what? I believe we're approaching the end of times and we hear that. Let me tell you something. When these things start to occur, you're not going to wonder if the uh, times are there. You're going to know that the only one, uh, that only God could be attributed to what is going on at that time. And I, I just love to hear people talk about that. And so, uh, but anyway, that happens in Isaiah 2, 17 through 21. Uh, you know, we've seen this prophesied as well. They are no doubt seeking refuge when they, uh, when they, they go in the caves and, and under the rocks. But uh, the, the thing about that is, they're going to be hiding from whatever it is. It may be asteroids. It may be meteor showers. We don't know, bombarding the earth. But in light of the massive earthquake and its continuing aftershocks, the, there will be widespread volcanic eruptions. And that, that's just the way it happens. And the other disturbances to the earth's crust, such all these places that people are trying to hide, that is talked about here, and prophesied in scripture, all of these places and rocks and caves will not offer any safety. So the, all the places that people have always tried to hide or when they, where they will hide at that time, there will not be no safe place because of the shaking of the earth and all the events that's gonna take in place. I don't think that's coincidence. God knows how, there, there's a sermon here, and that is this. God knows how to bring us out from our hiding places. 
And that's a sermon waiting to happen right there. The terrifying events prompt a worldwide prayer meeting. All right, but the prayers are to who? Mother Nature, not God. Now listen to this. They'll say to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne. And from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come. And who is able to stand? People will be so terrified, folks, that they would rather die then face the wrath of the holy God. But the thing of it is, they don't cry out to God. They cry out to the mother nature. They cry out to the rocks to fall on them. In other words, that reality, and the Bible calls about it fear, but I think it's reality that brings about that fear that, you know what, I'd rather die than face what I'm fixing to face. And that's the wrath of a holy God. Folks, God is going to judge sin. We can look at the world and think, man, they're getting by with this, they're getting by, they're getting by with it. There's coming a day, all right? And that's what we're talking about here. Mark 13, uh, 21 through 25. Listen to this. Uh, at that time, if anyone says to you, look, here's the Messiah, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So be on your guard. I have told you everything ahead of time, but in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. All right, be careful. How do I know? Remember, we talked about this last week. How do I know if somebody is false? You have to know the truth to understand if, that, if there is a lie being told to you or uh, someone says they are one thing, okay? When people say they are a prophet or people say they're a messenger from God, remember, if it don't line up from script with scripture, it is fake. It is false. And that's what he says here. There's going to be false prophets, they're going to perform signs and wonders and deceive, if possible, even the elect. So even those that are believers at this time, they will try to deceive them and will be deceived. So how do I not be in that portion of people? I learn the truth, desire the truth, live by the truth, and make that the measure of my life, okay? Depending on which view you take, and this could mean that the time that Jesus returns to the earth or simply the end of the first round of judgment, okay? As a result of this earthquake, the earth will be physically discombobulated. Think about it. That's a Tony word, okay? Uh, discombobulated. In other words, it is going to, to be shaken, okay? Uh, it talks about this in Hebrews 12, uh, 26 and 27. But for John's readers, this would signify the end of what? This would signify the end of the earth. Peter said to be looking forward to that day. Now, we have a lot of people who have a lot of fear about this. They have a lot of fear about reading Revelations and studying Revelations. But if we hear what Peter had to say, if you listen to this, in 2 Peter 3, 12 and 13, he says this, As you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming, that day will bring about the destruction of uh, about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat but in keeping with his promises we are looking forward to a new heaven and uh, a new earth where righteousness dwells without the destruction of this physical earth we cannot have a new heaven and a new earth so peter says what look forward to this the culmination of evil, it's going to be over. It's going to be done. We don't want to get ahead of ourselves, okay? Now, so let's move on uh, to verses 15 uh, through 17 here. We talked about that uh, a little bit earlier, okay? Um, and, and we read it. The debilitating fear caused by the disasters associated with this seal will affect all unbelievers. Uh, these seven categories embrace all classes of society. Now listen, look at what he said there. The kings of the earth. This refers to the heads of state throughout the world. The great men are the high-ranking officials in government. 
the commanders, the military leaders, the rich, those who control commerce and business, and the strong may well be those people who are influential. Together, they compromise the elite elements of human society. Ironically, okay, these are the very people who ignored the warnings of God, impending judgment, and persecuted believers, okay? So we've talked about the upper echelon of society and those that are in leadership, every slave and every free man encompass all those left out by the wealthy. So nobody will escape the judgment of God. People can talk a good game. Guess what? Unbelievers will be affected here. The reaction of the unbelieving world to the terrors unleashed by the sixth seal, <clears throat> excuse me, please, will not be repentance. It will be panic. Their reaction will be, oh my gosh, I just want to die. I don't want to face God. Okay. They will finally acknowledge that the disasters they have experienced are God's judgment. They're going to come back on that time when we thought it was peace whenever there was war, whenever there was famine, whenever there was so much death and pestilence in the land and whatever else is included uh, when those four horsemen are unleashed in those seals. But the reaction of the unbelieving world will be not repentance, but panic. They will finally know that those disasters came from the throne room of heaven and they are God's judgment of sin. Now, remember what I said about this. This is, this is, these four horsemen are unleashed from the throne room of God to exact judgment upon the earth. People will act with the utmost fear because they know the judgments of the Lord awaits them and not even death can prevent them from facing that and experiencing God's judgment. All right. Now, they desired the horrible death have an avalanche of rocks fall on us, okay, than to face judgment. However, that would not save them. We're not ignorant of this, but many of them may be. When Adam and Eve sinned, what did they try to do? Hide from the presence of God. What are these people going to do? Everybody left on the earth that don't know the Lord, they're going to try to hide. Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 14 through 18 said, The great day of the Lord is near near and coming quickly. The cry on the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty warrior shouts his battle cry. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of trouble and ruin, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness, a day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities, against the cornerstone towers. I will bring such distress on all people that they will uh, grope about like those who are blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Why are they doing that? Why are they panic? Because, oh no, I have sinned. Their blood will be poured out like dust and their entrails will, will uh, like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. Now, a lot of people look at that, but, but listen, uh, this is the reality. And you know, I often read uh, when I read these things in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament, I think they always, uh, this is coming from First Tony, okay? But they always talk about it's near, it's here. I think when prophets realize this, and I think uh, when they see the devastation that would be brought upon the earth because of sin, it's urgent. It was urgent to them because they were able to get a glimpse of that. John's able to get a glimpse of that. The New Testament writers, Jesus knew because this was, um, because this was going to be so severe, it was expedient. If I go to the doctor today and I find out really, really bad news, they're going to get me in really, really quick. But if it's something that may not come to fruition for a while, I might be able to put that off. So when we see something with urgency, we want to get with it quickly in trying to do what needs to be done, okay? And I think that's why they wrote about this. 
to be so expedient about being prepared for that day and being prepared for the judgment of God. First Thessalonians 5, 1 through 3 says this, Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. Writers always gave a sense of urgency to the day of the Lord. And you know what? We need to give it a sense of urgency. It is very expedient. Okay, It's not something that we uh, can put away or put off. By listening, uh, the one, by listing the ones that he did, John, in essence, is saying that those who might have escaped to this point will not find a way of escape from this one. This picture, horrifying and frightening as it is, is not hopeless. The church will be delivered from that time. Uh, look over in 310, great multitudes of people will be saved in the midst of the terrors of divine judgment. Both Gentiles, as we see in chapter 7, verse 9, and Jews, if we read Romans 11, 26. But the rest of the words of Hebrews will apply. And that is found in Hebrews 10, 31. And if you've never remembered this verse, you might want to remember it. Because in Hebrews 10, 31, it said, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. God will give us hope, but he also is going to bring judgment for those who do not grasp that hope. This was not written for us to fear if we know Christ. It was written to those who rejected God to take notice that God will ultimately call everyone to judgment and this will definitely be something for us to fear, be in awe of, be ready for that day. Thank you, Jesus, that he has made a sacrifice for our sins, that we can stand in this judgment, covered in the blood of Jesus, with a robe of white, a new name, and, and uh, uh, a hope beyond uh, this day of judgment and the wickedness in this world. Wickedness will not prevail. This has been such a week. Uh, we've seen so many things. And listen, folks, it will culminate. It will come to an end. So we need to have that hope, okay? So uh, we want to move into chapter 7 uh, here. We've spent a lot of time tonight on this, and I don't know how far we will get. But if we look in chapter 7, verse 1, I want us to look at the very first verse, and that may be as far as we get. But after this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. All right, now, the use of after this here signifies that the vision of the sixth seal has ended. And John is about to see a new vision. It may also indicate that this new vision depicts events that come after the sixth seal chronologically. The scene now shifts from judgment on the ungodly to special protection for the godly. The first describes, uh, described in verses one through eight are the Jewish evangelists who will be preserved on the earth. They will survive the divine wrath unleashed by the seal, trumpet, and bold judgment. God will also protect them from the murderous efforts of Antichrist to wipe out believers. Having survived the wars, famines, and unprecedented natural disasters, they will enter the millennial kingdom alive. The second group to escape divine fury in verses 9 through 17 constitute those who will be martyred. So let's talk about this seventh seal for just a few minutes. John saw the four angels standing at the four corners. So I want you to picture a compass, north, south, east, and west. Then holding back, them holding back, signified God's protection from harm. So we held back the four winds. They contrast the peace and security of believers with the terror of those hiding in the rocks. These four winds signify what? Destruction. So he holds up. God says, time out. Hold on just a minute. 
Imagine all that just happened in chapter six with earthquakes, meteor showers, and suddenly nothing. Look at verse two and three. It says, then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. All right, so what do we see happening here? It's a poetic way of saying from the east, the point of the compass in which the sun rises from John's perspective on the, let's think about John's perspective. So he's halted this uh, destruction. There's a wonderful calm. But think about John on the Isle of Patmos. The east would be toward the land of Israel. The land where God's promised salvation came through Jesus. John saw the angel ascending from the rising of the sun. That's a poetic way of saying from the east, the point of the compass in which the sun rises. From John's perspective, where he was on the Isle of Patmos, the east would be toward the land of Israel, the land where God's promised salvation comes through Jesus. So where John's at, imagine what he's thinking, imagine what he's seeing, a great hope. They are also described, these angels, as having been purchased from among men as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. We see that in 14.4. They will be most effective missionaries the world has ever seen and will be instrumental in the conversion of both their own countrymen and the nations. In ancient days, a king would push his signet ring into wax on a scroll or document. He would do this as a seal to mark uh, his ownership and protect its contents. That seal was not to be broken. God seals his believers as his own with his seal guaranteeing his protection over their souls. Here, God places a seal on the foreheads of his servants. In Revelations 13, verse 16 and 17, Satan counterfeits the seal that would become known as the what? Mark of the beast. It's a counterfeit seal. It is not real. It also forced all people, great, small, rich and poor, free and slave to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads so they could buy, not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This would mark the people belonging to God that we see here or belonging to Satan. So there will be an allegiance. There will be, we will either have that, there will be, uh, believers will have that seal on their forehead. Others will have that mark of the beast, okay? In chapter 14, verse one, it said, then I looked and there before me was the lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Why did they need this seal? This would come in a time of intense difficulty on the earth. There would be a time of unprecedented persecution and difficulty. In chapter nine, verse three and four, it says, and out of the smoke, locusts came down on the earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of who? God on their forehead. God will offer divine protection from some of the things that we're gonna see happen as we continue on in Revelations. Now, folks, I don't understand all this. I don't have all the answers. Uh, I read commentary. I read some books of some very respected authors and uh, people in ministry that I, that I trust. But that doesn't, that, you know, there's a lot of things here that have to be studied deeply. And I think God tells us that there are mysteries that we don't know. I think there's some things here that we may not fully understand, but it is important for us to see it because when we do see it, we may have an aha moment that we say, aha, I read about that. I know about that. Okay, all right, so uh, let's uh, uh, come back here next week. We're going to go back and review starting at chapter 7, verse 2. Uh, I'm going to put an underline in my notes, and so you guys who will be getting these uh, notes will uh, see a note in here uh, 
before next Sunday, okay? So that will be uh, the 17th. This is where we will start. And look forward to it. Guys, study this for yourself. Sometimes uh, I get a little quick in here. I get excited about studying about this. But take your time. Go back and read the scriptures. Don't say what Tony said. Go back and say the scripture said. That's what I want to be. I want this to come from scripture. I want this to come straight. When we come from scripture, we come from who? We come straight from God. And you know what? There are things that I just don't understand. And I hope to understand it by and by. But we have to look deeply back prior to people that wrote about this and John who's having this very vision. God bless. Hope to see you next Sunday night as we continue to explore some exciting things here in the book of Revelations. Next week, we'll pick up with chapter 7, verse 2, review it, and go back over it and uh, see how far we get through chapter 7. Thank you. God bless. I appreciate your faithfulness to watch us each and every week as we study Revelations. Thank you.